talking about uh, statically compiling Ruby. Hello everyone. So I must say that I had too much beer yesterday. So <laughs> what <a> my, <laughs> my mind is pretty somewhere. So um, I apologize if I speak too too uh, light. Anyway, yeah. So I'm gonna talk about compiling Ruby with uh, LLVM statically. So just a quick slide about me. My name is Laura Santonetti. I am a programming language nerd. <laughs> so I, I really like programming languages. I like learning them, uh, implementing them, especially. I'm the founder of a small company here in Belgium called Hipbyte. And we, yeah, the name of the company is Hipbyte because we were writing bytes before it was cool. <laughs> anyway. Uh, we do. Uh, we actually sell Ruby Motion, which is a statically uh, a static compiler for Ruby for iOS and OS 10 development. It is, it's a very small company. We are five people now. We are self-funded, <coughs> and we are completely remote. So I'm the only I'm the only guy here in Belgium working uh, for the company. Uh, yeah. Uh, before uh, before going into the detail, we need to go back in time a little bit. That was the best picture I could find on Google. <laughs> and we need to talk a little bit about the MacRuby project. And MacRuby was a project I created in 2007, uh, mostly as a hobby. I was working for Apple at that time in California. And basically, the goal of MacRuby was to replace Ruby Coco. So at that time, uh, at Apple, we really wanted developers to use Ruby as a first-class programming language. So as of uh, 10.5, as of Lopert, uh, we actually shipped Ruby Coco, which was a bridge, some sort of software between the Objective-C runtime and the Ruby runtime. And Ruby Coco allows you to write OS 10 apps, Mac apps in Ruby. Uh, the problem is that it quickly, um, I quickly realized that Ruby Coco was not good enough to write efficient apps because of its nature, because it's actually a middleware, it's a bridging, it's a software that bridges two separate runtimes, and you have both runtimes running at the same time, you have uh, two, two, uh, two unique uh, class um, objects, object systems running at the same time in the process, you get to convert messages called create proxies, and eventually um, we decided to do um, something different. I decided to actually uh, try to re-implement uh, Ruby, but using the GTC runtime instead. So no more bridge, so it should be faster, right? So I, in 2007, I created that project, MacRuby, and it started as a fork of CRuby 1.9, and CRuby 1.9 was the latest implementation of Ruby, and I just removed the object model, I replaced it with the GTC runtime, and it worked. And that was great. In 2008, I had a beer <laughs> with Chris Latner, <laughs> And he said, ah, you are still um, interpreting bytecode. This is very bad. And you should look at uh, LVM. Um, and at that time, LVM was not as popular as it is today. Um, uh, still, Chris uh, convinced me to have a look at LVM. And first, I, I said, oh, this is very complicated. I never used a compiler before. And then I looked, and it was written in C++, which is a language I hate, the passion. And so I said, mm, maybe I should do that later when I'm smarter. Uh, <laughs> but it took a few more days and weeks and weeks, and eventually it was for a break. I, I downloaded, uh, I think it was the, tu the tutorial on the LVM website, and they, they let you write a small language with it using the JIT. And it, didn't really, it wasn't really that complicated. And the cool thing is that <coughs> they only use a subset of C++ in LVM. They don't use the entire language. So you, it's relatively sane. You don't get. In 2009, finally, uh, I replaced the bytecode uh, between machine of, L of MacRuby with the LVM JIT. So instead of generating bytecode and interpreting it, we were generating IR and then using the JIT uh, execution engine. And it works. And actually, we, we made it on uh, Slashdot. And that was the first time uh, the project was on Slashdot. And Slashdot say that, uh, you cannot see the text, but the experiment and branch is three times faster. Because we didn't go with a uh, bytecode interpretation, it was way faster for very, very small uh, benchmarks, very stupid benchmarks. Uh, for real code, it wasn't three times faster, but anyway. And in 2011, I left Apple. 
um, to actually create my, my company that I mentioned it, uh, before. And the company does Ruby Motion. And Ruby Motion is basically a MacRuby. MacRuby is completely free on open source, so you can check the source code. And Ruby Motion is proprietary, so it's closed source. It's not really fully closed source because we open source bits of it, but it's it's really not open source as the, um, as the definition of open source. So it's basically MacRuby, but for iOS development, for iPhone and iPad development. And Ruby Motion is basically a few things. First, it's it's all driven by the command line, so it's uh, used Ruby Motion from the terminal. We implement a dialect of Ruby, not the entire Ruby language, because there are things in Ruby that don't really fit well for uh, embedded uh, devices. Such we as? Such as, for example, uh, code evaluation. Uh, we don't we don't support the evil method in Ruby. We cannot interpret code at runtime. And Ruby Motion is also, it's the same thing as MacRuby. We unify the runtime. Uh, it's also a static compiler, which is what I'm gonna talk about today. So we statically compile Ruby into uh, Intel um, assembly or ARM assembly. And we have lots of wrappers and it's commercial and it's, uh, it's actually a very uh, wealthy business right now. We have a lot of uh, customers. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about Ruby Motion today or Ruby or whatever. I'm just going to focus on uh, what we use LVM for. So if you actually have questions about Ruby Motion, uh, you should probably ask them later because I'm not going to talk about iOS or whatever. So first, let's 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 uh, talk a little bit about Ruby. So how many people here actually know what what Ruby is a little bit? Wow, pretty much everyone. <laughs> so the next slide should be, should go very quick. Anyway, uh, Ruby was it Ruby was created quite a long time ago, actually, in 1995 uh, by Matt Yuki Matsumoto. and I think the the main um, I think the the number one design principle of Ruby is that it was created to for humans, not for machines. So it was designed for the purpose so that you can enjoy programming and not create that many bugs and if, uh, it's very special. I, I recommend, if you don't know Ruby, I recommend to check it out. It's very good. So it, it's really a human oriented language. So a few more technical things about Ruby. It's dy dynamically typed. So you don't have uh, static typing. All objects have the type uh, defined at runtime. So it's, uh, it's mostly like JavaScript. So it's a dynamic language. It's object oriented. So everything is an object. Every Basically everything has a class associated to it. That's the <coughs> one thing to keep in mind. It has blocks. Blocks are basically a uh, uh, piece of code that are reusable as objects. So you can take a piece of code and create an object around it and then pass it to a method. So it's, it's, a, it's similar as uh, closures or lambdas in other languages. It has exceptions. So you can raise exception. You can unwind the stack. You can catch exceptions. And it has garbage collection. It has a lot of more things. But this language um, really is um, makes it actually very hard to compile statically um, if, you want re if you really want to be efficient. And I will try in this talk to, to cover a few. I cannot actually talk uh, about everything we do in the compiler, but just a few, few things we do so that you can have an idea of how interesting it can be. <coughs> and this is a very basic hello world in Ruby for those who don't know Ruby yet. Uh, you can create a class just by typing class hello. Then you define methods there using the dev keyword. Initialize is a is the default constructor method. Methods can take arguments. You can uh, instead variable are uh, variable that start with the ampersand, um, the at uh, character. So at something here is an instance variable. Something simple, right? There is not not much to say about Ruby. And uh, the standard Ruby, we call it C Ruby because it's written in C, but it doesn't really, a lot of other Ruby implementations are written in C anyway, so it's kind of weird. But the main implementation of Ruby uh, works like this. You have Ruby code that's uh, compiled into an AST by a parser, and the AST is the abstract syntax tree, it's some sort of a tree of uh, elements from the code, and then uh, it's compiled into a bytecode for a very small virtual machine. That's, that's how uh, C Ruby works. And of course, we, we don't want that. We want to use LVM, right? 
And so Ruby Motion works like this. Instead of generating a bytecode, we generate IR straight from the parser, and then we compile it into assembly. Then we can run it on the machine. So no more virtual machine. We, r we run it natively. Uh, so as of as of actually yesterday, I checked the Ruby Motion compiler is a lot of, is very big. It's close to twelve thousand lines of C plus plus. We use the C plus plus API with LLVM, um, which was made, uh, we don't really have any choice because we cannot use the, the C API. We really have to use all the features of the of the project. Uh, we target LLVM to the four, and we support we support the entire Ruby language specification. Uh, they are not really specifications of Ruby, which is why I use uh, quotes here. But uh, there, are, there is an effort to actually um, create uh, executable specifications for the Ruby language because there are lots of implementations of Ruby now, and there is a part of that specification um, that that defines the the language, so all the keywords, etc. And the compiler supports everything. Uh -huh. That's not very. Uh, can, you, can you read that? Maybe I should use a girl. So the thing is that when we compile a Ruby file with a compiler, we generate a bunch of functions. And there is one function, which is a very ma the main function. We call it a file scope. Every file will have a function that will initialize everything that's in the file. And Every class, we also have a function that we call the, funct the, the class constructor. But it's not really the constructor as a method constructor. It's more to, to actually create the class at runtime. And then in Ruby, actually, in here, maybe, maybe you can see that we create a class that generates from hello. And here, we define a method. But here, we can actually, you can actually use code. You are not limited to define methods. You can, for example, type 1 plus 2 here. So you can actually have code <coughs> inside class definitions. So in order to actually uh, support that, we actually create uh, sub-functions inside class definitions, and we run them with a, with a receiver so that you can actually send messages there. But the basic idea is that we create a lot of functions when compiling a file, and every class will have its own function, and also uh, the, file, the file can also have code at the end or at the middle. For example, at the very bottom, we can actually instantiate the other class and do something with it. And so the, the main, the very main function will actually call all the constructors of the classes, but will also um, call code that's defined it at the same level. And oh, that's even less really Can you just read it out? Yeah. So uh, when, when you define the when we define the method in Ruby Motion, we create uh, two functions. First, we create a function with the actual code. So that's, that we call it the, the implementation, the imp. And this function, we keep it around so that if you call it, uh, we can actually retrieve the implementation and actually use it for something. Then we create some sort of a trampoline function. We call it the objective C stuff. And this is, this, it is exactly a very small function that calls the main one. And we insert this one into the runtime, the objective C runtime. So why do we do that? It's just because objective C is a little bit different from Ruby, it's based on C. So methods can have C type arguments like integers or floats or structures. And with these don't really exist in Ruby. So we have to create some sort of stuff that converts things. Anyway, so we have always two, uh, two, met two functions created by methods. <coughs> so if we look at uh, a simple method here with three arguments, we are going to generate uh, a function, a uh, function. And all the functions that we create for methods in Ruby version always have at least two arguments. Uh, the first one is a reference to the receiver that's going to be the default object where messages are being sent. Uh, we call it self, but you can provide any name you want. And the second one is uh, a pointer to the message that's going to be that's being sent uh, right now. So we call it the selector. And after that, all the other arguments are actually um, just there on the on the method, on the function. And here we can see that uh, every variable is actually a 32-bit Intel, uh, sorry, integer. It's because we target 32-bit platform here. 
but it can be in a 64 if we target a 64-bit platform. So something very basic again, a conditional. We define a method that accepts an argument, and if the argument is true, we return true, otherwise we return false. That's not very useful, but just to show you what the code we generate here. So we still define our hello method here. <coughs> and in Ruby, an object is uh, in Ruby an object is false if if it's actually the false uh, immediate or if it's nil. If it's nil or false. Otherwise every everything else is true. So here we just um, we just compile a switch statement to the something argument and zero is a special value we use to define uh, nil. Sorry, false. Zero is false and four is nil. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But we use a trick in the Ruby Ocean, in the Ruby runtime called uh, uh, tag pointers, target pointers. So it allows us to uh, to hide information into pointer addresses. Anyway, here we use zero and four as special values, special immediate values for uh, false and nil. So we just compare them and we, just, we can return uh, whatever value we need. But well, that's something very simple, right? Uh, all the local variables are always allocated on the stack uh, using the alloca instruction. So something very simple. And uh, the goal is basically to benefit from the, the mem to write pass when we generate the, the final assembly. Block variable, a, lit, a, lit, a little bit trickier. Uh, I didn't include code here uh, because I didn't understand that a block variable is basically a variable that's being used, that's defined inside a method. Then you create a block, and inside that block, you actually access that variable. So it's a variable that's being shared um, both by the block and by the, the method. So here, for, um, we really want to be efficient, so we always allocate block variable on the stack by default. But if the block is going to escape the main the scope of the method it was created from, we, re we reallocate the variable on the heap. And here, I didn't show code, but we actually, the compiler is going to, to emit two variables, one which is a pointer to another variable on the stack. And we use actually that, that pointer to load um, any, any read access to that variable. And if eventually the block has to escape the method, we actually change the pointer on the stack to actually no longer the stack, but something on the heap. So this way, we have, we have both words. We keep very fast uh, variables. And in case the block has to leave the method, we need to reallocate uh, uh, the variable and we just uh, use malloc here. Then there is, okay, there is something that we, um, something that we call the kernel in the compiler. And this, this is where uh, LVM is starting to be very, very interesting here. So we wrote a bunch of primitive, uh, runtime primitives. So these are the functions that the compiler will generate calls to. This, this is basically our uh, runtime primitives. For example, we have a primitive to, uh, for arithmetic operations. We have one to actually uh, deal with instance variables, so get or set. Uh, we have one to actually for a method dispatch. <coughs> and all these all this, uh, functions are defined in C, of course. But we use LVM to actually compile them into a bytecode. So we have this .bc file, which contains a bit code of all our functions. And when the compiler starts, it loads uh, the bit code. And then all the functions are actually available for, uh, for us to call them inside the compiler. And also, the, the bit code provides the initial module. So we don't create a module, we just load it. And this is our uh, comp compilation module here. So and as, as an example, uh, this is how we actually compile this <coughs> variable. So here we have a constructor, and we set uh, this is variable foo to uh, something we, we receive as an argument. And we're going to generate this code, basically initialize method. But what, what you really need to uh, keep in mind to see is that at the very end, we generate a code to vm <coughs> underscore ivar underscore set, which is our primitive for a uh, instance variable set. And we provide a bunch of arguments, which are not very interesting here. But anyway, this is where we're going to set our instance variable. And the uh, vm underscore ivar underscore set is defined like this. This is the C code. So I just trim out some comments and whatever, but it's basically the ID. What it does is that it 
if the object is actually some sort is actually a real object, one of the main classes of objects we create, uh, the variable is actually inside the object with, a, with a, an array of variables for um, for object, and we uh, we actually cache. We just need to restrict the index of the instance variable inside the object. And here we use a simple technique to cache a slot with a cache variable. And anyway, uh, the second part is that we receive a pointer to the slot inside our uh, object. And the third part is that we actually emit a right barrier macro. And this will actually uh, this is actually a macro that translates into a call to this uh, function, which actually sets eventually sets our address, right? So we have the store stat equal goal here. So basically, we're going to compile um, a bunch of LVM IR that will call this native code, right? And what's great is that after in, in release mode, we actually activate a lot of LVM passes. And there are many of them that we use, but mostly at the very end, we will actually have something like this. Our function will actually, all the code, has been was LVM IR and it is actually some some of some of it is actually in line uh, as of our final method. So instead of adding a call to the VM underscore IV underscore set function, we actually add straight code that sets our instance variable inside our function. Which is really great. This is one of probably one of the best features of LVM. It's all the optimization passes that they do for you. And because of that um, we have a very very fast instance variable supporting Ruby motion. It's for it as fast as something in Objective C. Ah, something very funny also. Uh, arithmetic operations. So here we have a function that a method that that returns a twenty one plus twenty one, yeah. right? Which is the answer of all <laughs> questions in the world. And <coughs> so here in Ruby, every everything is a method. So here we actually send a plus message on 21, and we pass uh, only one argument, which is 21. So this is the same as doing 21 dot plus, open parents, 21, closing parents. And so normally we should compile this as a, we should actually send a message here. But in Ruby motion, because arithmetic operations are very, very common, in especially for IS development, we wrote an optimization. So we are we're going to generate a call to a vm underscore pass underscore plus, which is a primitive, and we pass our, uh, our arguments here. So you may see that we actually pass uh, uh, 85 both times. 85 is basically the, the, the representation for the 21 uh, fixed number. So this is a technique I've talked about. Um, in order to avoid using uh, heap memory for simple things like fixed nums or floats uh, for simple integers. We actually use this technique called tag pointer. So we, we basically we, we, we use um, an address and we fit, the, we actually fit 21 inside the address and we actually shift uh, the representation to a few bits and we set one of the last significant bits to a value <coughs> that will be different from a, a standard addresses that have been allocated and that have been aligned. So, we, so the runtime when when the runtime deals with 85, for instance, well, it knows that it's not a real address that has been aligned in memory because the last significant bit is one. So it knows that it's some sort of a fake object, and inside that fake object we have our 21 uh, value. Anyway, this is uh, this is um, I think that that trick was invented by self uh, a very long time ago. So it's a very common trick. Everyone uses it. And anyway, this is our, uh, our VM underscore fast underscore plus uh, function. And here we check if, <coughs> first we check if the method has been overridden. If it's overridden, we need to dispatch uh, the plus message. Otherwise, if both operands are actually numeric types, which is um, um, numeric type, which are actually real numbers, then we can actually check if both arguments are fixed numbers. So if both arguments are actually fake, fake object that I just talked about. Then we can simply just do the, the operation here, the plus operation here, and return it. And of course, if, if the result can actually fit inside one of one of our fake object, then we can return a representation for it. So this is uh, the fast pass of the plus operation. And the slow pass is, of course, to actually dispatch the plus message to the, uh, which is very slow. We, we don't want that, we want a fast one. 
And anyway, after passes, we get this. Our uh, post <coughs> returns 169, which is uh, 42. So all the code that you saw was just in line and remove and smash and at the end. Yeah, yeah. So Ruby has uh, exceptions, and in in the compiler, we actually implemented them as C++ <coughs> exceptions, which was probably a mistake when I realized it. But, but, but basically, the idea is that we I really wanted to have zero cost, um, no more flow, uh, execution style, because in well, as you know, exceptions should actually should only be used for uh, exceptional cases, should not be used for regular control control flow. And if you use C++ exceptions, the the try operation is actually cheap, very cheap. It's actually there is no cost for it. So I decided to actually use that for Ruby because the the other implementation of Ruby I actually uses setjump and longjump for exception flow, which means that every try statement, which is the beginning uh, expression Ruby, has to actually call setjump and it's costly. So here we don't do that. So basically, we you can all the all the exception handlers are created using C++ exception handlers, and we use the the LTM IR uh, intrinsic uh, instructions for that. So for example, if we know that we are inside the handler, we use the invoke instruction instead of the call instruction, and we provide a basic block where we compile a landing path, receive the exception, and. Because Ruby is a dynamic language, you cannot really type the exception you want to receive. So we just catch all exceptions. So it's, it, it, it makes it uh, simpler. So we, we have a catch all uh, landing path close in every exception handler. And finally, when, when, you, when we raise an exception for Ruby, Ruby code, we just trigger uh, eventually a call to um, the C++ uh, runtime function to actually throw an exception. So I didn't actually inc include code for that part, but this is uh, how we deal with it. And for head for a head of time a compilation, it works very well. We used to when we actually use LVM as a JIT, it starts to be problematic because all the exception under table have to be generated at runtime, and there are bugs in LVM, and it starts to be tricky. But for a for a static compilation like we do, it just works. Why did you say you regret using the C++ exception? Hmm? You said that you regret choosing the C++ exception for the task, so yeah, it would be a better alternative. I think it would have been better if we actually had a just a simple flag in our virtual machine hmm. and just check that flag and uh -huh. I mean something more uh, optimized for runtime. Because the problem of uh, all this all this thing, it's a lot of very complicated code that you need to generate and it's, it's kind of fragile. So LVM likes to break things in the dates. Yeah. Well, it used to be a lot worse in the 2.4. Mm. So if you follow in 2.4, you're going to get some pretty horrible exception handling. But after 3.0, it got a lot better. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so before if you could migrate, you'd probably be able to do all that very easily. Very, right, yeah. I know that the, the intrinsics are just um, relatively new. When we, when we used a remotion a few years ago, uh, LDM a few years ago, we actually had, we had to compile those to the... We didn't really have the intrinsics back then. But yeah, we actually use do that for historical reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had to do it again, I would probably uh, not use C++ exception. <coughs> and and the compiler also supports dwarf. And I think that Remotion is the only uh, Ruby language that uses dwarf. So our compiler emits a dwarf metadata for uh, for the the source code ex ex uh, expressions in your program. So first, all the instructions have a proper uh, debug location metadata. So you know that for every every location inside your source code, we actually compile uh, the file name and uh, the line number inside the file. Uh, the, the method and block arguments are and local variables are also typed in the dwarf metadata. And at the end, the build system generates a uh, DC bundle. That's only for the Mac, but the DC bundle contains uh, the dwarf metadata. Then <coughs> you can use the dwarf dump on the command line to actually see what, what the compiler generated. And it is very, very interesting because um, when you connect GDB or LDB to a review motion process, then you get access to uh, file numbers. When you have a backtrace, you can see the location of the file for every Ruby frame. 
Uh, you can set breakpoints to a very specific, to a, for example, you can set a breakpoint to foo.rb line 42, and it, it will just work because uh, the compiler knows exactly uh, what address to break. Uh, when, when a Ruby motion application crashes, you get a stack trace, and then if you use the Atos command line tool, and you provide it with the dsim bundle, it actually symbolicates the cross trace for you. So this is awesome. And also you can connect a profiler. If you connect instruments to a Ruby motion uh, process, Instruments will actually be able to symbolicate uh, backtraces when you do when you does profiling. So every uh, car call stack can be a uh, symbolicator. I'm going to show a demo to the dwarf because it's very cool. And finally, we have a, we actually have a rubbery with motion that is only uh, available for um, for development. So when you when you work with a simulator, the iOS simulator, so it doesn't work on the device. So basically, the repel lets you evaluate expressions at runtime. You can type 1 plus 2, and you get uh, 3 <laughs> in the terminal. And because RubyMotion is statically compiled, we don't really have a code evaluator inside RubyMotion apps. <coughs> so what we do is that we actually, uh, um, the process, the application process, will load uh, um, a shared library that contains uh, the entire compiler, but it's Except that it, it doesn't do static um, static compilation, it uses the JIT uh, execution engine instead. So the, <coughs> the application process loads the uh, Ruby motion compiler as a JIT, then it creates a pipe to actually, so that you can, a Unix pipe and an expression that you type on the, on the terminal are being sent to the, to the remote process. Then are being uh, compiled, executed, and then the result is sent back uh, to the terminal. Okay, if I have time, I, I would like to show you a demo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is how we create application in motion. Just type um, motion create hello, and you get a new directory. And that break, it builds the app. Okay, we have the simulator here. And this is the repel I was talking about. Here you can type expressions. And these expressions uh, will be sent the process running here and compile it to machine code and then send back, which is really nice. Uh, I could actually connect. Uh, we have this file here, <coughs> application delegate. So, for example, I can type type some expressions. I can. Uh, again it should be and I have my alert here so now I'm, I'm going to uh, use the debugger and show you the dwarf uh, uh, support if I type break debug oops oh it's not connected yet I need to start with sorry actually one thing I can do is that I can just make a mistake and it will raise an exception. Now if I start the debugger, boom, I'm stopped here. And if I ask for the backtrace, as you can see here, that was the last frame, Ruby frame. And we have the, the application file and the, the line number here. And actually I can, I can, frame select. I prefer GDB for a debugger. <laughs> really don't like LDB. So here you can see the source code of uh, our function. This is awesome, right? Yeah. And you can print the alert. Here, all is a macro that we defined for um, 
uh, printing Ruby objects. And I don't know the LDB command to show the, var the variable on the stack, but if you do it, um, GDB it's show variables. Anyway, so that's that's the dwarf uh, support uh, in action. So it's very very nice. Oops. Uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, if I could uh, summarize my, my my experience with LVM, I would say that it's uh, on the plus side, it's very very great to write uh, static compilers. It's really designed for that, and you get you get a bunch of very nice optimization. <coughs> it's very nice. It's uh, easy to target new, new platforms once they are supported by the backend. So you can just target new uh, uh, architectures on new platforms very easily. And yeah, there are lots of optimization passes. I really like that, so I had to put a third bullet. And on the, on the mini side, if you use the C++ API, it breaks uh, pretty much every, every release. Every week. Every week. <laughs> so at least. Every time, we, every time we support a new version of LVM, we need to spend at least a weekend to, I don't know, deal with the API changes. Uh, also, LVM is pretty. The code size is pretty huge. I think it's. I think in. In our in our case, it's pretty close to uh, 20 <coughs> megabytes. If all the modules we're using LVM, maybe 10 to 20 megabytes. So it's actually big to embed. So if you want to uh, ship uh, uh, something based with LVM, uh, it can be a problem. I think uh, the IR is not 100 percent portable. So that's for it. Something that comes to my mind is a function called ABI. If you target a very specific architecture, you need to emit a very specific IR for that architecture. For example, uh, for a very one example, for example, if you target 32-bit Intel and 64-bit Intel, they have different. Um, you need to emit different code when you call functions. For example, when you have uh, arguments that are larger than um, typical arguments for, for that language. So it's it's the IR is not 100% portable, but it's very very portable. Uh, one of, one of, also one of one of the minus part is that because of its license, uh, there are backends that can be proprietary. And an example is, for example, the ARM64 backend that Apple didn't actually provide the source code yet for it. So only Apple can but target. But you can now you have the open source one. The ARM64. Yeah. AR64. Well, in, in not under 2.4 in is there? Trunk. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And Apple is moving to it. So the the, the is is there really? <laughs> <laughs> I checked last week, it wasn't there. Really? The yeah. Apple ARM64 <laughs> isn't there. There's an open source AR64. Yeah. yeah, there is an open source one. Yeah. yeah. The real one from mm -hmm. Apple. But the, 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 the open source one is the one that you should be yeah. using. The open now source on. one is the real Even one. Even Apple, Apple is going source. to use that one. Okay. <laughs> so you know I didn't know that, so yeah. Just <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, as a JIT, uh, LVM is not really it's not as great. Um, for 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 MacRuby, we use LVM as a JIT for everything, and we notice that uh, code generation is a bit slow, and it's 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 not very easy to uh, get rid of the code that you generate. Mm. You can free the machine code, and you need to free the exception under tables. And you get all sources, and sometimes it just crashes because yeah. you free the wrong thing, so it can be uh, complicated. It's um, funny that the uh, le low-level virtual machine is not good as a JIT or an execution environment. Yeah. But well, I think it's, I don't know, I think Apple also puts a lot of effort in making a great static compiler, and yeah. not a lot of effort in making a great JIT. And yeah, I know that there, there was a Python initiative uh, to create a Python uh, implementation using the LVMG by Google, mm -hmm. and they I think they, they gave up on this because mostly because of the same. I, I'm, I also know the uh, people who do another Ruby implementation using LVM as a JIT called Ruby News, and they also have problems. So yes, I would say that write static compilers is great too. If you want to use it as a JIT, you probably have to do some testing first. Mm. But anyway, LDM is awesome. <laughs> and it has an awesome logo, right? <laughs> and thank you.
We have a few minutes, 15 minutes for questions. Um, do you have any plans or do you think about porting this to the backend side? So for like not like this Ruby or even say Linux, so you can run your Rails app uh, or run your Rails app? No, not really. We don't really have plans for that. Um, because we actually try to, uh, to make money from it as a business, and I don't think, there is, I don't think it would actually be uh, viable. I mean, most Rails developers actually run Ruby code on servers, so they scale on the server side. Yeah. So the license for the static compiler, is that open source or proprietary? It's proprietary. Yeah. Proprietary. Yeah. Yeah, but the, the MacAbee project is open source under the uh, BSD license and it has a lot of common code. Oh. So we already have an implementation of Ruby using LDM, which is free. It's Mac Ruby. Oh. But this one, it's, it's a little bit different. It's a code. Okay. Yes? What was the hardest part in converting your uh, syntax tree into uh, my R code? The hardest part? The hardest part. Uh, I don't think there is one other spot, it's just very... I don't think there is one... You not have any major problem. F from the IR, from the AST, no. But it's just that it's very... Yeah, Ruby is a very complicated language. Very, very... It looks simpler, but it's very hard to implement. And so... Yeah, we, we actually, we still have cases where we don't actually compile a very specific part of Ruby because it's something nobody uses. And for example, yeah, in the last release of RubyMotion, we supported the definition of the bang method. You can do a def uh, bang, and then nothing. And this method is called when you do a bang your, obje your object. And we never supported that, never. And no one uses that. And we just got a report for someone, and we just implemented it, of course. But it's, yeah, Ruby is kind of weird. And there is no true specification of Ruby, so which makes it even harder to implement. So oh, yeah, but I think it's just um, takes a lot of time to get things right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say the, the other thing in Ruby is a uh, constant lookup, by far. Const lookup in Ruby is very, very hard. Even the creator of, of Ruby, Matt, doesn't even know it by heart. He said it's too complicated for him <laughs> because there are so many rules for const lookup. I mean, you can just look for a constant in the main scope and then according to where you are, it's different. I mean, it's very, very hard. Yeah. What's uh, next for uh, Ruby? What's next? Yeah. Uh, Erin 64. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm 64. I'm going to work on that as soon as possible now. And the next thing is that for this year, we will support a new platform, mm -hmm. uh, something that will be new. And we will. Uh, there will be a conference, a Revolution conference in San Francisco. And more stuff here. What's the, the new platform? Uh, I cannot talk about it. Are <laughs> <laughs> you going to move to more recent version of uh, LLVM? Why are you using the old version? Sorry? Are you going to move to more recent version of LLVM? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we tried, but it's, as I say, it takes it takes like a weekend to, um, to port the API, so. If it's just a weekend, that's actually quite fast. <laughs> My experience in the past, in the, in the times of 2.4, it was, at least a week, but a it could week? take a month. Yeah, a month. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's <laughs> the, uh, because it, it was a, a C and C plus plus front end, so it was like oh, yeah, even, even thousands don't, don't of frighten him, please. Please. <laughs> Don't frighten him. It's <laughs> <laughs> please. So now it's uh, <laughs> two hours. <laughs> 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 we only use the uh, the instruction API um, for generation. I mean, we don't use the parser thing, or but maybe it's easier for us. So yeah, in, in my experience, what breaks the most is the exception thing. It changes almost. Sometimes the code that you add, you need to use a new instruction there. And mm, yeah, yeah. But mm. ah, yes. Do, do you have any ABR compatibility with the other Ruby, or is there any other Ruby? No, because no. You have the open source version, right? And yeah. That compiles statically, or no? No, it doesn't. Ah. It doesn't. So yours is the only static compiler, yeah. so you don't compose any of that. No. We don't. They will have to be compatible with you in the future. That, that would be very, very. I don't even know. Yeah, we are.
Yeah, we are the only one doing uh, a static version of Ruby. So we're we're actually working on a benchmark suite right now, and yeah, we don't really have official benchmarks, but in my testing, super things like arithmetic operations or a log data set. All the phone kind of so you can have that on the other side. It depends on what you want. Yeah. 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 Y
think so, but yeah, for, for what you might know. I didn't talk about it but it was related to us. Yeah, I was Right now to support R64, what I do is that you can ask me to use it straight as a name. Then I use Xcode's M2, which supports the backend, and I use the LTO. Yeah, it's a link Exactly. So I provide the big code that read to the Xcode LD, which supports R64. Uh, uh, I'm using these tricks, so the Yeah. So you made it. Yeah. 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 You, you just came away with it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you don't even have to guarantee that if you get the good stuff, it will be there. The point is, uh, it yeah, it's yeah. Ah, yes, 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 yes. yes. So every multidimensional array is like a sparse matrix, and you have to accept it. If, 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 if you use the dynamic array, you have a static array, then it's a block. Then it's a block. Right, right. I've seen there was like two hundred dollars in the table. So like I'm going to ask you more questions if you if after the talk there will be a question session. <laughs> so it will be a machine gun question. What about this? What about that? And this one? <laughs> I was sitting there, I was like, really? Yeah. 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 I had some yeah. rifles. <laughs> <laughs> like, with some of the like, subjects. Like, actually, like, I don't think of that. No, actually, I saw that. If they actually have a talk, I'm going to see if the NBM is there. Yeah, it's just some way. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y
I got to Sanders, yeah. You got something? Yeah, so best trip. And I found this. What? A bumper collar. This is a good thing. No, it's horrible. Well, I had to get one. Right. Maybe we should start to write and just let people taste this the open source coke and this is the closed source coke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what what is best. <laughs> but there is open source beer. Have you seen this? Yeah. It's Brazilian. Yeah? Yeah? That recipe, but I don't know. It's a free this beer. is actually a brand. It, 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 I like the name because it's And they have, I think, version 4.0 or something. So it's just the recipe to use it. And, and that you can sell if you produce this. And they produce it themselves. And they can sell for like $30 or $50 a bottle. Really? And people buy it not to drink, just to have it. Should we get going? Yeah. So, folks, uh, this is Kai Nakai, and he's going to talk about the LLVM pilot. Yeah, hello. Uh, as Renato said, my name is Kai.